Secretary has agreed to talk about the subject of, uh, or his view, or his perspective on the situation in Iraq, and uh, challenges to America's security interests, which covers, of course, a range of, of, of matters. And one of his primary interests, as I understand it, in the Defense Department has been in the weaponry that is appropriate to the variety of challenges which we do face in a, in a new era. The, uh, the Secretary uh, has had a marvelous career in, in business. Uh, all of the big names that we think of commonly in the defense industry, uh, Honeywell and Lytton and Lockheed and General Dynamics, uh, have been places where he's worked on interesting matters, both in uh, the uh, uh, space industry as uh, in aerospace, as well as defense matters in, in general. Uh, he has uh, dealt with the space program, as I mentioned, very early in his career. He's dealt with naval aircraft early in his career also. Uh, more recently, he has dealt with land systems and then combat systems in general. And his last position at, uh, uh, was on the uh, dealing with questions of uh, information technology uh, and international matters. In his current position, of course, he's responsible for a lot of the technical matters within that complex organization, the Department of, of Defense. I should note that he served as first in the Bush administration as Secretary of the Navy, Deputy Secretary, or Secretary of the Navy, then as Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security for a period of time before returning to serve for the second time as Secretary of the Navy. And it was from that position that he was appointed to his present position uh, as uh, Deputy Secretary in the Department of Defense. He brings a very interesting career, which I have to note is asterisked by very impressive, impressive civic service. Uh, and he's, his awards are not only from his alma mater, the University of Maryland in engineering, uh, but also from uh, the major industrial and uh, uh, administrative organizations or associations of the country. I should note that not only is he a product of the University of Maryland, but Mount St. Joe's High School here in Baltimore, having been born here in Baltimore, and I'm delighted to see that there's a group of Mount St. Joe students here to welcome uh, the Secretary this evening. In any case, we're very fortunate uh, to have this range of subjects addressed by a very senior member of the Department of Defense, uh, one who's active uh, in every facet of their activities, including on some levels the diplomacy of dealing with the ambassadors of foreign states. During Ramadan, he most recently was meeting with a, a number of the ambassadors from uh, uh, Muslim, Muslim states. It's my enormous pleasure to present to you the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Gordon England. Anyone here from Balmer Hun? <laughs> I will tell you, it is great to be back in Baltimore. Um, as Frank said, I was born in Baltimore, and I grew up when it was indeed the Baltimore Colts, right? And Johnny Unitas and Ray Berry, and I still remember my dad taking me to the games and working at the ballparks. I worked at the Colored Association. I still remember when Lou Campanella was catcher. And I remember working at the ballparks and selling peanuts and all those things growing up here. Went to St. Bernardine's uh, Elementary School and then on to Mount St. Joe, which was uh, one of the great uh, occasions in my life in terms of having this uh, great values-based education plus just a great education. So it's great to be here. Plus, like uh, Sputnik 50 years ago today, Sputnik 50 years ago today, it's always good to achieve escape velocity. And for me, though, it's merely out of the gravitational pull of Washington. I, uh, I have a philosophy that every day out of Washington adds a week to my life. <laughs> and it's particularly nice when the destinations here nearby among literally friends uh, from way back uh, you may see some security personnel with me tonight. Secretary Gates, as you probably know, is traveling. He's down in South America. 
And of course, they're generally here to make sure I'm safe, but I actually believe they're here to make sure I go back to the Pentagon after this, <laughs> after this talk. Secretary Rumsfeld used to describe Washington, D.C., used to say Washington, D.C. is 25 square miles surrounded by reality. And, and so this evening, I'm in reality land outside of Washington, D.C. So ladies and gentlemen, the distinguished guests and members of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs, uh, thanks for inviting me. It is indeed a distinct pleasure to be with you this evening. And I also thank you for your interest and involvement in foreign affairs and all the important issues that are shaping our nation and the world at this, at this very important juncture. It's been uh, almost seven years since I started working at the Pentagon and for a short time at that startup which is the Department of Homeland Security. I did have the pleasure to be the deputy to Tom Ridge as we tried to put those 22 agencies together. Now, I arrived almost seven years ago. When I arrived, I was a fresh and a spry and an innocent 63-year-old. And when I arrived, the world was a far different place than it became for all of us on 9-11. And that was literally the day that changed my life, I think probably changed everybody's lives and, and literally changed the world. Now in Pearl Harbor, I was born in 1937, so in Pearl Harbor I was four years old, and it's not lost on me at all that on 9-11-01, my granddaughter was four years old. And on that day, on 9-11, terrorists turned civilian airlines into guided missiles, and they killed 3,000 people of 60 different nationalities that day. And so once again, our nation and the world were drawn into a war by a relatively small group of extremists who follow a misguided ideology. So I thought since then, why did the terrorists kill 3,000 people on 9-11? And I've concluded. The reason the terrorists killed 3,000 people on 9-11 is because they didn't know how to kill 30,000 or 300,000 or 3 million. But they would have if they could have. And they're still trying. And I don't think anybody would disagree that that day, if they could have killed more Americans, they would have done it. And then if you agree with that answer, that they would have killed more and they would still like to, then you also know that our nation can, can never go back to this more comfortable time before 9-11, although a lot of people would like to do that. You can't ever put the lid back on Pandora's box. Now, this great American experiment that we're part of has faced challenges before, and we have always passed the test with innovative tactics, steadfast resolve, and bold leadership and we will again. Now, as a nation, we are willing to sacrifice our blood and our treasure for our founding belief. And we've done this for over 230 years, and that founding belief is freedom. The fundamental value of America is freedom for all of our citizens and for other people around the world. And we also know that in so doing, as we make other people free, we better secure our own freedoms. In his recent address to the United Nations, President Bush cited the responsibility of all nations to stand up for freedom and liberty. So I have just a few of the ex excerpts, and this was just very, very recently. He said, terrorists and extremists who kill the innocent are a threat to civilized people everywhere. And all, all civilized nations must work together to stop them. In the long run, the best way to defeat the extremists is to defeat their dark ideology with a more hopeful vision of liberty. So citizens of Lebanon, Afghanistan, and Iraq have made the choice for democracy. And every civilized nation has a responsibility to stand with them. The extremists are doing everything in their power to bring down these young democracies. And the people of Lebanon, Afghanistan, and Iraq have asked for our help. 
he went on to say that every civilized nation has a responsibility to stand up for people suffering under dictatorships. In Belarus, Belarus, Cuba, North Korea, Zimbabwe, Syria, and Iran, brutal regimes deny their people the fundamental rights enshrined in the Universal Declaration of the UN. Americans were also outraged by the situation in Burma, where a military junta has imposed a 19-year reign of fear. The United Nations must insist on free speech, free assembly, and ultimately free and competitive elections. Now, at a recent hearing in Washington, Secretary Gates was asked how he would define victory over terrorism. So Secretary Gates said first that the conflict, quote, will be with us for decades. So all of us will be grappling with this issue for some time. In terms of the gold, he said that terrorism will not be eliminated altogether, but it can be reduced, quote, to a level where you can continue daily life without feeling imperiled or putting civil liberties at risk. And the way to get there, he said, is through three things, political solutions, economic development, and partnerships with other nations. Now, being born in 1937, less than a month ago, I celebrated my 70th birthday. And I reflected that the state of the world has undergone dramatic changes in those past 70 years, and likely far more so than any time in human history and in the total context, I believe, for the better. In 1937, when I was born, America and the world were recovering from a devastating economic depression. Opportunity for world trade was severely limited. Communications and cultural interaction was difficult and relatively rare. Very little of the world was truly free. Communists in the Soviet Union were engaged in bloody purges of Stalin consolidated power, and in Asia, Tojo's forces were making the first incursions that would lead to the war in the Pacific. In Europe, Spain was engulfed in a brutal civil war that tested the military tactics, which the Nazi and fascist forces would soon unleash, plunging the planet into the most horrific war in human history. Now, even though I was very young, I still remember the dark, but the also hopeful days of World War II. And one of those early memories has stayed with me. One day in 1945, workmen came to the square where several streets intersect, intersected near my home on Mulberry Street, so out in West Baltimore. I lived in a row house and all the city streets came together. It was just a little square, you know, where the cars went around. I mean, we thought it was huge. It's probably as large as this platform I'm standing on. Nonetheless, a small spot, a small square in the middle of the city, a little bit of grass, and my brother and I played there with the other neighborhood kids. And in 1945, one afternoon, a simple sign was erected. Workmen came, put up a small sign. The sign was about to sign like a no parking, you know, just a small sign on the pole, very simple sign on the pole. And the sign read, Francis Callahan Jr. Square. I can vividly remember the sign and the printing on the sign. So that night when I went home, I asked my mom, who was Francis Callahan, Jr. And my mom told me that he was a young man who lived in one of the houses by the square. And he was a Marine, and that he had been killed on Iwo Jima. And his family erected the sign in his honor. And that memory remains vivid with me after all these years. And because of the sacrifices of thousands like Francis Callahan, Jr., America and freedom triumphed in World War II. 
And because of them, and probably veterans here tonight from World War II, I was able to live a life of freedom and a life of opportunity. That victory was made possible by the extraordinarily men and women in uniform and by the dedicated civilian men and women who were the backbone of our industrial might. All of us today live the lives we do because of what they did for us. Now, when the war ended, people felt entitled to a period of peace. But communism did not cooperate. Rather, the nation found itself again in conflict, this time in Korea, the first bloody battle of the long Cold War. In those difficult days, President Dwight D. Eisenhower said this. He said, the history of free men is never written by chance, but by choice and their choice. Our nation and our allies faced the Cold War with a sustained commitment to success for over 40 years. And during this period, our political leadership agreed that containing and stopping the expansion of the Soviet Union was central to our national survival. It wasn't about Democrats or Republicans. It wasn't about liberals or conservatives. Rather, it was about a shared commitment to the fundamental value of our nation, freedom. After 40 years, liberty again had won the day, this time thanks to the shared commitment of the United States and our friends and allies. When the wall came down and the Cold War ended in 1989, most people again expected a peace dividend. But you know, freedom has never had an easy path. So what I'd like to do now is share a few of my own perspectives about today's security challenges along this hard path we're still on to preserve freedom. And now, as Eisenhower said, it's our choice again. This is a critical time for America. Today, the nation faces a broad array of security challenges and great uncertainty about the future, maybe more than ever before. But there is a hopeful outlook if we recognize and if we respond to the challenge. Terrorists have declared war openly and explicitly against the United States, our friends and allies, and all who love freedom and liberty. Iraq and Afghanistan are the front lines in the war on terror, but they aren't the sum total of the war. Instead, Iraq and Afghanistan are a lot like Korea, that is, closer to the beginning than near the end of this war. The war on terror is not likely to end anytime soon. Radical Islamists are on a different clock altogether, a clock that records time a millennium or so into the past and generations into the future. And their clock is totally out of sync with the clock in Washington, which is driven by electoral and budgetary cycles. This war will not be lost on the battlefield, but it could be lost in Washington. There are no clear, easy answers in Iraq. All war is tough and dirty and dynamic, and there's always a kind of fog at the strategic level as well as at the tactical level. Iraq is part of the broader war on terror, and we've never fought a war quite like this one before. The ways and the means, that is, our toolkit, include all the instruments of national power. As General Pace said, security in Iraq is part of a three-legged stool, security, governance, and the economy. 
You need all three to make it work, and that's what our national strategy reflects. Security and economic development are two sides of the same coin. You need security for economic development, but long term, you need economic development for security. And we shouldn't think about Iraq in isolation. Iraq is part of a much broader dynamic. Next door, Iran is reasserting itself. Tehran wants to be a player on the world stage and wants a strong say about the Shia holy cities in Iraq next door. Other neighbors in the region, Arab states like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Jordan, have unique and important opportunities to help Iraq by supporting Iraqi reconciliation efforts. Across the region and beyond, extremists using distorted ideologies are attempting to commandeer the peaceful religion of Islam. And conflict in Iraq between Shia and Sunni could exacerbate that fundamental historical tension throughout the Islamic world. But meaningful progress is being made, especially what I call on the ground, reconciliation, economic development, less violence, even without the national progress we would like to see in the Iraqi government. Here's what Lieutenant General Ray Odierno, commander of the multinational command in Iraq, said on Tuesday before the National Press Club. And I believe that he summarized the situation extraordinarily well. He said, from a security standpoint, the surge has created time and space necessary for the government of Iraq to move forward. The military aspects of our strategy have achieved momentum, but we have not yet achieved what I would characterize as irreversible momentum. We fully expected the mixed sectarian areas and fault lines to be the last to settle. That is where we will continue to maintain higher troop concentrations. There will be challenges to the successes in Anbar province, and that's where things are right now extraordinarily peaceful, and other places. And it will be up to the Iraqi security force with our support to meet those challenges. The time is now for the government of Iraq to aggressively follow up with essential services, economic development, and political accommodation. A clear need for tangible and sustained Iraqi political action and success does exist today. However, there's no universal solution for Iraq, and some strategic patience will be required to give the Iraqis a chance. Our goal is to move from the forefront to the periphery of planning and conducting the majority of operations in specific areas as local security conditions permit. So this is a mission shift from leading to partnering to what we call overwatch. It entails tier levels of overwatch, that is tactical to operational to strategic levels as the Iraqi security forces assume increasing responsibility for their security. It can be very tempting to overestimate progress and withdraw too many troops before the area is ready. The question that will define how quickly Iraq stabilizes is whether the conflict is resolved violently or peacefully. The Iraqi people seem to be making that choice today. They are tired of the violence that has engulfed the country for the better part of the last four years, and they are standing up to prevent extremists from further destabilizing their proud country. Our goal in Iraq is an Iraq that is self-reliant and politically stable with institutions and resources it needs to govern justly, secure from internal and external threats, 
inaccessible as a terrorist safe haven and integrated as a productive member of the international community. Such an Iraq is in the best interest of the free world and is vital to our enduring goals in this critical region. And here's a few facts about Iraq. First, there are 24 partner nations with personnel in Iraq. Total attacks countrywide have decreased 11 out of the past 13 weeks for those lowest levels since April of 2006. And interesting now, we're in Ramadan for the last two and a half years. That has been a steady increase during Ramadan of attacks and that has not happened this year during Ramadan. Totally weekly attacks have decreased for the eighth straight week, which is the longest sustained downward trend since January of 2004. Peak electricity generation, which is very important because of jobs and factories, met or exceeded 5,000 megawatts on all but four days in the past month, including the highest record on September 11th. Now the Sunni tribal awakening, Al Anbar. Al Anbar is in the west part of the country and it's an area as large as North Carolina. And the north central provinces have resulted in the recruitment of over 52,000 concerned local citizens to coordinate with coalition forces and the government and of Iraq to enhance neighborhood security. When I was in Al Anbar province about six weeks or so ago, that day there were four incidents in Al Anbar province, an area as large as North Carolina, and I'm sure almost every day any major city in America has more than four instances. Seven of the 18 Iraqi provinces are now under provincial Iraqi control. They're controlling their own security forces through local government coordination with the central Iraqi government. And citizen response to what we call the national and regional tips hotline, that is providing citizens the ability to report insurgent and criminal activity, those tips have gone up 100% in the past year. Now regarding Afghanistan, so let's move on to Afghanistan. There is reason to be both optimistic and cautious about the current situation. So both optimism and to be cautious. So here's some reasons to be optimistic for Afghanistan. Significant progress made to date. There's been free and fair presidential parliamentary elections. There's some access to health care and better education. Military operations this year put the Taliban's leadership off balance and disrupted plans for their spring offensive. The Afghan National Army is performing better than anticipated at this point, and the Afghan National Police are showing progress. And there are seven other coalition partners, the UK, Canada, France, Belgium, Germany, Netherlands, and Romania, that are working with us to train the Afghan military and their police. The U.S. government has appropriated $10 billion, almost doubling assistance to Afghan to date. And these, that money is funding projects that have a real impact on people, like power and roads, agriculture development, education, job skills, and the like. And there is a general sense of optimism and determination among the Afghan leaders and the people. They regularly voice their appreciation for our assistance and they believe things have improved since last year. And we need to continue to help them succeed and there are 40 partner nations with us in Afghanistan working to help them succeed. Now that said, caution is wise. Violence is increasing in Afghanistan. Explosively formed projectiles, that's sort of the upper end of IEDs that you read about, are now starting to appear in Afghanistan, similar to the kinds, we, the kinds of IEDs we see in Iraq. 
the government of Afghanistan and the international community are not meeting what are the popular expectations regarding governance, security, and development. The people are demanding more than they are getting. Narcotics production has increased again this year despite increases in eradication programs. And ultimately, frankly, we need viable economic alternatives to growing poppies. And the Afghans grow poppies out of necessity, not desire. Now, Iran. Iran is not helpful to coalition efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Iran supplies the Shia militia groups in Iraq with training, funding, and weapons, and particularly those lethal IEDs. It also continues to provide money and weapons to Hezbollah, which threatens the legitimate government of Lebanon. Iran's most destabilizing activity has been the pursuit of nuclear weapons technology in defiance of the international community, the International Atomic Energy Agency, and the United Nations Security Council. The United States is not interested in a confrontation in the Gulf. We are interested in assuring that the commerce of the region benefits the world which is why our military forces, which are there for stabilization, operate in that region. So this is, again, a time of decision for America, time of choice. And as the philosopher and political economist John Stuart Mill said, war is an ugly thing, but it's not the ugliest of things. The decayed and degraded state of moral and patriotic feeling, which thinks nothing is worth war, is much worse. So this is not a time to retreat, but a time for bold American leadership in the world. President Bush said, we can succeed if we don't lose our nerve, because freedom has had the capacity over time to change enemies to allies and to lay the foundation of peace for generations to come. The challenge to the nation is to summon the requisite will, commitment, and resolve to show the terrorists in Iraq, Afghanistan, and around the world that they will not succeed, not now and not in 20 years or 50 years from now. Now, at the same time, major states like China and Russia, whose, whose future paths are not yet clear, continue to pursue sophisticated military modernization programs. They are not problems, but we have to prepare for an uncertain future. Meanwhile, in a highly globalized world, the risk of proliferation will only grow as access to technology and the ability to move technology increases. North Korea. North Korea has been a constant security issue. Progress is being made in North Korea, but there is still a long way to go. The six party talks held in Beijing between the People's Republic of China the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, the Republic of Korea, Japan, the Russian Federation, and the United States have resulted in, nuclear, in North Korea shutting down its nuclear facilities. Just yesterday, the six parties announced their latest agreement regarding denuclearization of the peninsula. In return for its actions, North Korea is receiving fuel oil as part of an economics incentive package. The remaining, however, and very large problem is that North Korea still has weapons grade nuclear material and they continue to develop a full range of delivery systems. This is obviously threatening to our friends and allies in the area and to the United States itself. The situation dominates the security concerns, as this is a core security issue for everyone. That said, progress is being made, 
but neither the United States nor other countries will be comfortable until North Korea renounces the use of nuclear weapons and, after all, weapons fissionable material has been removed from their country. As we look to the future, great major clashes of armies on the open battlefield are unlikely. Instead, it's far more likely to look like Hezbollah's attack on Israel last year, when assailants launched rockets from the middle of town and hid among civilian populations. It's harder to locate that kind of adversary. And while it's still reasonably easy to destroy that kind of adversary, it's very hard to do so without killing or injuring anyone else. As it was throughout the 20th century, technology is still an integral part of the threat and the solution to emerging challenges. But in the 21st century, technology will be brought to bear in some new ways. So cyber warfare is already here, that is attacks on internets and our digital systems. And that's the challenge that probably keeps me awake more than any other. The cyber attacks earlier this year against Estonia temporarily turned one of that small nation's great strengths, its technological savvy, and basically everything there is a network in that country, it turned that strength into a vulnerability. <clears throat> that attack was like the first use of gunpowder, a wake-up call and a signal of a new form of warfare to come. Cyber attacks, tactics and techniques are continuing their involvement, or they're evolving, and they're improving, so there's no static solution to this problem. This will be a continuing technical evolution. So lastly, one request from all of you before I conclude. And so a different subject, but a, but a very important subject. The greatest short-term threat to the nation may be a terrorist attack, but whatever the greatest short-term threat is, the greatest long-term threat is our nation falling behind in science and technology. Now compare our population. The United States, we're about 303 million people. China's 1.3 billion. India's 1.2 billion. And I don't know what percent of a population are technical geniuses, but let's assume it's 1%, whatever it is. And consider that science and technology education is rapidly on the rise in these and other emerging countries. So think of their potential for growth and innovation just by numbers. Think about what happens when the Chinese government decides to leverage crowdsourcing Strictly by the numbers, the U.S. is at a disadvantage in science and technology, and therefore we must, we must be preeminent in our education and in our applications. The entire U.S. economy and the U.S. military are based on advanced technology. In the military and in the private sector, you need brilliant innovators in the labs and you need workers, recruits, who are technologically savvy enough to make use of the latest developments. And it's not just about application, it's about fundamental science, math, and physics, the foundation of all creative application. So I would urge everyone here to take every opportunity you can to reach out to young people and to encourage them to consider science and technology as they make decisions about their future education and careers. And I also encourage you to support education at all levels in these fields. So my last comment, on 9-11, a reporter asked a little nine-year-old girl, what is patriotism? What is patriotism? And remember, this is a nine-year-old girl. And this nine-year-old girl said, patriotism 
is taking care of America. So I thank each of you for your patriotism. I thank you for everything you do every day to make a safer and a more secure world for our children and our grandchildren. I thank you for the opportunity to be with you tonight, and I would be delighted to answer some questions. Thank you. God bless you all. Well, we thank you for such an absolutely clear presentation of your purposes, the status, and, and uh, supporting principles. Thanks so much. Yes, sir. By the way, uh, we have two microphones. Feel free to take them. I won't repeat the questions if you're at the microphone. If you get answered, uh, if you answer from the floor, we'll have to repeat the question. Yes, sir. Thank you for that uh, wonderful summary, and welcome back to Baltimore. Thank you. Um, people have said, and this is General Casey, members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Fallon, and others have indicated that we cannot maintain the force levels given the size of the army. And yet, very little progress is being made in the political area in Iraq. I would like your general comment on, on that area. Uh, well, two comments. Uh, first of all, progress is sort of, in, I said on the ground, I mean, it's sort of interesting. Uh, the, the people themselves, I think, are taking uh, matters into their own hands. I mean, there is great progress on the ground. The level of violence is coming down. By the way, I was with people today. Uh, we've opened 17 factories here recently, large factories. By the way, they make all sorts of tractors and trucks and leather jackets and clothes and all those things. So there are factories across the, the nation now, Iraq. Factories are opening, people going to work, schools are open. So things are indeed returning to normal. Uh, it is indeed a fact that the political process is slow, but also I think we have to consider our expectations. I mean, it's a brand new democracy. Uh, they've been at this a very, very short time. It's very difficult. Look at our own Washington, D.C. I mean, you know, today we don't, quote, have an immigration bill because we can't come to grips with that in Washington. So I think it's very hard. I mean, we, in 1776, we got our independence. We had, you know, uh, started with our uh, confederation in the early 80s, 1780s, and finally had a constitution in the late 1780s. So it took us a long time to get there. And I do believe there's a degree of patience for, the, for them to learn how the political, pro that is, make accommodation, compromise. But in the meantime, things are improving. We will be bringing troops out as they increase their own security. So mixed bag, but on balance, since the surge, the quote to surge started, there has been considerable, measurable, meaningful progress. And I will tell you, we are hopeful with the outcome. Still has a ways to go, but, but it's hopeful. Just as a quick follow-up, you didn't address the, the you know, the force levels that we cannot sustain while this progress is taking place. Well, we can sustain, I mean, we can sustain the plan in place. I mean, we do have today, I believe, 21 what we call brigade combat teams. They will be coming out. And so Secretary Gates said earlier when he came on board that we would have a certain combat period and dwell period, and we're working to meet those combat and dwell periods. So. I mean, we, we will end up, the plan we're on, we will have a sustainable force. Thank you. You mentioned that one of the things that can keep you awake at night is the possibility of cyber attacks. I wonder if you could say a few more things about the dangers of cyber attacks and what we are doing to uh, uh, combat these. So I will comment, certainly everything now is becoming web-based. I mean, literally all of our industry, all of our financial systems, I mean, everything now is ones and zeros. And everybody has security on their systems, and, you know, we have firewalls and passwords, all sorts of things you do. But there's also very, very sophisticated attacks. Pentagon has attacked all the time our networks. I think it's well known to her probably every minute of every day we're attacked either by just a hacker or somebody more sophisticated. So this is fundamentally based on technology, staying ahead in this technology. 
but all of our systems are susceptible unless you take appropriate precautions and I cannot discuss all of what we do, but there's a great deal of your tax money that gets invested in this area, and it needs to be invested in this area. So I believe we are ahead. We plan to stay ahead. But again, this is an area you need to be paranoid because you don't know what other people know and what they're doing. And this is slowly becoming or rapidly becoming the foundation of everything we do in this country. So fundamental has to be protected. And we spend a lot of energy doing that, but it's always worrisome. One of your recent predecessors, Paul Wolfowitz, uh, in the buildup to the Iraq war, established a, a special office uh, that, that uh, sought to develop the intelligence to uh, justify the invasion to, to, uh, of Iraq. Uh, two of his close associates, longtime close associates, Douglas Fife and, and David Wormser, uh, were, were operatives in that office. Uh, we know Mr. Wolfowitz is gone. My question is, uh, is that office still in operation? And uh, are Mr. Feith and Mr. Wormser still uh, working within the inner circles of the government? Uh, I don't know about the third name. I mean, Doug Fife is no longer with the government. But I can tell you there's been a lot of uh, I won't say investigation, but a lot of looking by the Congress for years and years. The conclusion is there's actually never been such an office doing that sort of a task. So while there has been years of, of debate and looking at this, my knowledge is, and I was not in a position, frankly, even to be aware at that time, but, but the clear impression I have from all the work that's going on is that that's not the case. I mean, there was never a separate, quote, cell to justify the war in Iraq. I mean, I, I believe that's sort of been the papers for a long time, but it's never been shown to be the case. Do and, I understand you correctly, or are you case. saying that office didn't exist? The, uh, the office, as you described it, to do intelligence to justify the war in Iraq did not exist. That is correct. That's what I'm saying. That's news to me. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, you mentioned, of course, that 3,000 Americans had died in the World Trade Center uh, incident. Could you tell us how many Iraqis have died during this war? How many Iraqis have been displaced and gone to other countries? And could you tell us the sources for this information? No, I don't know the exact number. Uh, there's been lots of different reports. Um, and so I don't know the exact number. And I don't, I don't know the, the number at all, Frank. I mean, there's been all sorts of different reports about it. I think in terms of people who left the country, the last I saw was in order of about 2 million Iraqis that are in both Jordan, Syria, and different places, and approximately. I've seen numbers that have ranged all the way from about 40,000 to about 200,000 in terms of Iraqis that have been killed. But frankly, I don't know what that number is, so I, so I can't bring any light to that. Why don't you know how many Iraqis? Why doesn't the Bush government know? Is that because the number of Iraqis killed is not important? No, Why I, don't I doubt you if, know? I doubt if the Iraqi government knows. So the, I, the American government has made no attempt to find it. Okay, it, okay, because there's a, there's they don't a lot, care. Thank hey, you. God bless. There's a lot of things I don't know, so sorry I can't help you. Uh, in Afghanistan, we're fighting, it seems to me, two wars, one against the Taliban and one against drugs. I believe we're not being fair to our soldiers by mixing up these two different things. Let give the soldiers a break and get the Afghan people on our side and forget about the war on drugs and let the Afghan government, when the uh, Taliban war is over, let them handle that. But to uh, put our soldiers at, at more risk by trying to fight the drug war at the same time, I think is unconscionable. Well, I believe that is indeed a debatable point. Uh, I would tell you, I believe where the consensus comes down, however, is that you can't have a stable country based on drug money. So if indeed you want a stable Afghanistan and one that does not allow terrorist camps and it just actually has a rule of law and has a rational economy and all those things you would hope for, if the foundation of that is drug money, then that's probably likely not sustainable. So, 
So I would expect, and I believe the approach is, you actually need to deal with both of those issues if you're going to have a stable Afghanistan, and that's certainly the objective. I had something very specific that has been with me for a long time, and I was wondering whether you could answer the uh, position of the United States and how much support the concept has of partitioning. I use the Yugoslavia model when Tito left, and it was partitioned, and there were problems because of the partitioning of Yugoslavia, but it went in a more natural way with all of the trouble it caused. But when all the countries of the world really supported the instability that it uh, uh, caused and and, and came to a resolution, and it took quite a while, it seemed that the partitioning really worked, and perhaps in future years, these countries will come back together in some way to support each other better. Now we have the Shia, we have the Sunnis, and we have the Kurds with problems if they did partition, but the United States is blamed for many of the deaths because they're holding back the natural forces there. What if we moved to the borders and kept the outsiders from coming in and did more to let the Iraqis settle their own differences, perhaps to partition and make, help make the partitioning fair because there are problems. One problem is with the Kurds and Turkey I, I think if they became independent. Your general question, I think, is to get an observation on partitioning of Iraq. Yeah, I hear it being brought up from time to time, and this for a long time had been on a concern of mine, and I wondered why that wasn't a policy for the U.S. to pursue. Well, it comes up once in a while. But, of course, Iraq is a sovereign nation, so, of course, they sort of decide it's not us. Uh, secondly, when you talk to the Iraqis, they actually don't want to be partitioned. They want to be a nation. They want to remain a nation of Iraq, and they want to have a society where you can have both Shias and Kurds and Sunnis all together. So, I mean, that is their objective and their desire. So there's no desire in Iraq to make this partition, just the opposite. They would argue that's what they do not want to do. And, uh, and by the way, I believe it should be a sustainable country, uh, just like we are in this country, it should be an integrated country. Let me see if I uh, can quote you correctly. You said there were those who were, quote, trying to commandeer the peaceful religion of Islam. Was that a quote of yours? Yeah, I believe it was. I'm not sure exactly, but yeah, it sounded good. Since uh, <laughs> sounds close, every Muslim nation is trying to sworn to wipe Israel off the map, and their goal is to conquer the world for Islam. And those who don't convert, they say their own holy book, the Quran, tells them to cut their heads off. How can you refer to that as a peaceful religion? Well, I would have I have a different view of that than you do. I mean, my view is that is one interpretation, but that's a very radical interpretation of Islam. And so there are radical Islamists who indeed believe that. In the United States of America, we have four million people of Muslim faith, and they do all sorts of jobs and work in America, and they're very, very successful and integrated into our society, and they're Americans who participate in a democratic process. So while there are radicals that have that view of the world, that is not what the Muslim faith is, that is not what Islam is, I would say you have to be very careful. We know from Japan, right, radicals managed to take over religion. Small numbers of radicals in Germany eventually took over the government. So you have to be very careful. I think, I think Muslims need to be very careful that Islamists don't start speaking for the religion. And in fact, it's very important that every day, you know, moderate Muslims speak out in terms of the importance of representing their faith as it is taught, not just as radicals would like it to be uh, both taught and, and uh, practiced at the extremes. So I would just disagree uh, with the characterization. And again, look at America. We have about 4 million Muslims, doctors, 
nurses, all sorts of professions here in America. And the fact is, I will tell you, the American experiment shows that it is indeed possible, and it does work to have people of Muslim faith integrated with people of all other faiths, and they get along in harmony. I mean, God bless America. It works in America. And that's the great, great hope it'll work everywhere. If I remember correctly, in your speech, you had mentioned that the Russian Federation, along with the People's Republic of China, was one of those nations that had a um, supposedly unclear future. And in Russia, as of late, we've seen with uh, President Putin suggesting that he may become prime minister following stepping down as, pre is stepping down as president, and also with the uh, resumption of these massive uh, bomber patrols not seen since the height of the Cold War. Do you think there's a possibility that we could see a rise of this of a similar confrontation like we had between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War in the modern day, and do you think that would impact our policy in the war on terror? Uh, no, so you're really referring to the bomber flights and the things yes. going on in Russia. Well, I mean, Russia is asserting themselves. The question is, are they doing that for international reasons or domestic reasons? And so, I mean, it's always a question. You're always cautious, and so, you know, we have sort of forces on the ready sort of thing, but no, we don't view that as threatening. Uh, it's probably more for domestic consumption than international consumption, but we do not view ourselves threatened by Russia, uh, and hopefully won't in a uh, you know, long time into the future. So again, work closely with countries like Russia and China to develop the right kind of diplomatic uh, relationships. By the way, I will make a comment about this. I, I have this philosophy that people talk about friendship between countries. I actually don't believe there's any such thing, per se, as friendship between countries. That's far too abstract. I mean, friendship is about friendship between people. So for everybody, if you want to have friendship between countries, then you actually get to know people in other countries, you know, and you meet them and talk to them and understand their views, and you try to establish bonds, enough people do that, then you have, quote, friendship between countries. So look, Russians, uh, you know, my uh, boss was in Russia not long ago, knows, uh, uh, you know, President Putin. And uh, so we have strong relationships. And uh, so, no, we don't see a threat from Russia. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I thank you for this, for this debate and this discussion as part of what is still this great American experiment. And I will tell you, I am blessed every day, as Senator Warner told me, to have a front row seat in Washington. And so I am blessed, and I'm blessed to be here with you all tonight. Thank you all very much. <laughs>